The first Thomas video game we'll be taking a look at is none other than Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, released in 1984 by Grandstand Leisure Products and Clearwater Features. This is believed to be the very first Thomas video game ever made. It's basically an old school handheld game, much like the Game & Watch handhelds and Tiger handhelds. This one in particular was made by the Grandstand Company. For those of you who don't know, the Grandstand Company was an electronic game manufacturer during the 70s and 80s. It was based in the United Kingdom and New Zealand and was responsible for distributing many old Sega and Pong consoles in these countries. The company was later bought out by Tiger Electronics in the late 80s, and they made the company manufacture the Tiger handheld electronics in these respective countries. But before this happened, Grandstand got to manufacture some of their own handheld electronics. One of these handheld electronics was themed around none other than Thomas himself, probably making this his first ever appearance in a video game. The plot of this game is simple. You have to control Thomas and drive him around this little map to gather all the parts he needs to build James. Yeah, that's right. You're building James. Along the way, you have to avoid a head-on collision with an open wagon on the tracks, take on some water, clean out Thomas's chimney, collect the fancy trophy, and complete your quest to get James up and running. You earn some points each time you complete one of these little tasks. The object of the game is to get as many points as possible. That's about it. For Thomas's first dabble into the world of gaming, this isn't half bad, but it's not all that great either. It is kind of cute and interesting to me, and it must have been nice to play back in 1984, but nowadays, it's just another outdated piece of gaming history. Unless you're a collector who loves to collect vintage video games, including old school handhelds like this, I wouldn't say this is something to brag about. Next up is Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, released in 1990 by Enigma Variations, Peakstar Software, and Alternative Software. This is one of the very first Thomas computer games ever made, and it really kicked off Thomas's experience in the video game industry. When the game first came out, there were a total of three different versions that could be played on three separate computers. The first version could be played on the ZX Spectrum, the second version was available on the Amstrad CPC, and the third version was released on the Commodore 64. I got all three of them to work on my Steam Deck to play them myself. When you compare the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC versions together, they might look the same, but when you look hard enough, you can see some of the color differences. They also have some different sound effects and music quality, so they're both completely different despite appearing the same. I personally think the ZX Spectrum version looks better between the two, but the Amstrad CPC version has better sound effects and music quality. The Commodore 64 version, however, is the one that stands out the most among all three of them. It has even more color details, the sprite designs of the characters and the environment are a bit more visually appealing, and the gameplay is a bit smoother. If I personally had to choose which one I like the most out of all three, I would have to go with the Commodore 64 version. It's just the best looking one, and has the smoothest gameplay too. Despite their differences, the gameplay and overall objective are exactly the same throughout all three of them so they're not super different from each other. The object of the game is pretty simple. Thomas needs to complete a total of seven jobs within a week. Thankfully, you don't need to do them in a particular order. 
You can choose whichever one you want to start with and go from there as you please, as long as you finish all of them before the end of the week. The object of each job is to collect a specific load and take it to its destination to earn points. Simple as that. Along the way, you have to avoid obstacles such as fallen trees, broken rails, rocks, and other engines to earn more points. Once you complete all of the jobs, you enter your name to record your final score. And that's it! I have to say, the plotline here is actually pretty good for a Thomas game. Just completing some basic jobs is a perfectly fitting concept for a Thomas game, since that is what he does for most of his life anyway. The game does have a few problems though. For starters, the graphics haven't exactly aged the best, especially the graphics on the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC versions. Also, the lack of supporting characters is a bit disappointing. The only other characters that make an appearance in this game are Duck, Diesel, and Sir Topham Hat. That's it. The game can also be incredibly difficult and frustrating. Duck and Diesel always randomly appear from out of nowhere, and it can be very hard to avoid crashing into them. Also, that title screen music on the ZX Spectrum version... Oh my god, that's creepy! Of course, all of these negative aspects don't make the game bad by any means. It's still pretty engaging and fun to play, even for adults. Also, for Thomas's first computer game, this is an excellent start that would make way for future Thomas computer games to come. But the game is still far from perfect and really needed some more work put into it. However, a fourth, fifth, and sixth version of this game would eventually come out two years later. These updated versions would soon prove to be MASSIVE upgrades from the original three versions. But we'll get to them later. We still have a couple more Thomas games on our list that came out before these updated versions that we need to discuss first. Released within the same year as the first Thomas computer game, we have Thomas the Tank Engine, Fun With Words, released in 1990 by Alternative Software. This computer game is considered to be the sequel to all three versions of the original Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends game released in 1990, and there were also three separate versions of this game that were made. Each one would be sold onto separate computers. The first one would be sold on the ZX Spectrum, the second one on the Amstrad CPC, and the third and final version on the Commodore 64. All three of these versions, once again, have different visuals and color filters depending on the computer it's made for. The Amstrad CPC version and the Commodore 64 version almost look the same, but if you look hard enough, the Amstrad CPC's color filters make its version look a bit more vibrant. The ZX Spectrum version, however, got the short end of the stick. It looks the least visually appealing out of the three this time, due to the massive lack of color details. It still has some colors to it, but it still doesn't look that great. Between these three versions of Fun With Words, I think the Amstrad CPC version is the best version, but the Commodore 64 version is a very close second. Despite all of the visual differences, the gameplay and overall objective for all three versions of this game are pretty much the same. As the title suggests, this is a basic word game made for younger children. There's a total of six minigames to play. The first minigame is Spell Picture, where an image will pop up and you'll need to spell out what it is. The second minigame is What's Wrong, where you'll find a misspelled word and need to correct the spelling. The third minigame is Mix and Match, where you have three columns with letters in them. An image will appear, and you need to remove one letter from each column to spell out the word describing the image. The fourth minigame is Letter Fun, where you'll see the five main vowel letters inside some train sheds, and you need to pick one of them to fill in the blank and complete the word. The fifth minigame is Lively Letters, where Thomas will bring a letter to complete the spelling of a word, and you need to determine whether or not the word is spelled correctly. And the last minigame is Letter Shapes, where there's a giant column of letters and Thomas will bring you an extra letter. If that letter matches one of the letters inside the column, you need to click and drag that letter over top of the corresponding letter. And that's it. That's the whole game. Now, I understand this is supposed to be a basic kids learning game, and I don't have anything against the idea of Thomas having basic kids games. 
After all, Thomas is a character that was specifically made for children, so it only makes sense for him to have some educational games from time to time. But the only thing that really bothers me about this game is that it was marketed as a sequel to the original Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends computer game, and that just doesn't make much sense to me. A basic spelling game doesn't feel like a worthy concept for a sequel to its original counterpart. It feels more like its own thing, separate from the first game, and it should have been marketed as such. Regardless, this fun with words game isn't bad at all. It's still kind of interesting in its own way, and they really managed to get very creative with the type of word games they have, which is pretty cool. But still, this shouldn't have been marketed as a sequel. It's better off being considered its own thing, separate from the original game. That's pretty much all I have to say about fun with words. Next on our list is TV Phone Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, released in 1992 by Ben Presto. Not only is this considered to be one of Thomas's very first Japanese games, but it's also one of Thomas's very first arcade games as well. This arcade game in particular is a part of Ban Presto's TV Phone arcade series. For those of you who don't know, the TV Phone series is a series of arcade cabinets made by the Ban Presto company. These arcade cabinets were designed to look like Japanese payphones. They had a TV screen, a coin slot, a card dispenser, a card reader, a fake telephone, and a number keypad underneath the screen, which would be used as the controller. Many of these TV phone arcade cabinets were themed around popular characters in Japan, like Mario for instance, but the one we'll be focusing on is the Thomas TV phone arcade game. To start up the game, you first need to put some Japanese yen into the coin slot. Once you do, a card will be dispensed from the bottom of the cabinet. You take it out and put it into the card slot underneath the screen to begin the game. Interestingly, in some of the footage I found of people playing this arcade game, the cards that are dispensed actually feature some pictures of the CGI Thomas. Keep in mind that this arcade cabinet first came out in 1992, around the same time as the third season of the TV show. Yet, the cards here show the CGI Thomas instead of the classic model Thomas, which must mean this arcade cabinet must have managed to survive and stay in service for over 20 years. Anyone would have expected a simple arcade game like this to die out after 5 to 10 years, but lo and behold, this little 90s arcade cabinet managed to live long enough to see the 2010s and witness the CGI era of the show. And on top of that, Ban Presto must have taken the time to update the cards for this 20 year old arcade cabinet to have them go hand in hand with this new era of Thomas. That's pretty impressive. It's unknown whether or not it's still around today, or if the cards have been updated again for the All Engines Go era, but the fact that it managed to stick around for so long is quite amazing if you ask me. Alright, let's talk about the game itself and see if it's any good. Once you insert your card, you can choose whichever of the three sections you want to play. Each section revolves around either Thomas, Gordon, or James, and they each have their own bundle of quizzes and mini-games. Throughout each section, you'll frequently receive phone calls from either Sir Topham Hat or the engine you've chosen. Once you put them on speaker, they'll ask for your assistance in a pop quiz or minigame, such as building a path for the engines to follow, winning a race against Harold, and rolling the dice to help the engine get to the station. To interact with the game, you have to use the telephone's keypad to relay the instructions given to you by the characters to complete the minigames and quizzes. Once the game is over, you can keep the card as a little memento. And that's just about everything this arcade game has to offer. Now, I personally don't think this game is super impressive. It's really just a basic quiz game with a few mini games thrown that can easily be completed with just a few button presses on the number keypad. There's also not a whole lot of interactivity here. And plus, each of the three sections can be completed within the span of a few minutes. After that, there's not much replay value to it. On top of that, you can't even pick up the actual phone on the arcade cabinet and hold it up to your ear to actually simulate the feeling of being on a phone call with Sir Topham Hat. That's just a bit disappointing. Complaint aside, this is still a very interesting Thomas arcade game. It has a unique cabinet design, the sprite details look pretty detailed and fantastic, 
and the fact that this arcade game managed to stay alive for so long to witness the CGI era of the show is a huge miracle. Overall, I'd say this TV phone Thomas game is very unique, and it deserves a bit more attention than it gets. If you're ever on vacation in Japan, and if you by any chance stumble across one of these arcade cabinets, maybe give it a go for yourself. It might be something worth experiencing for yourself. Plus, you get to keep the card, which will definitely make a nice souvenir if you're a diehard Thomas fan. Returning to the computer department, our next game is Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, released in 1992 by Peak Star Software and Alternative Software. Remember when I said that there would be a 4th, 5th, and 6th version of the original Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends computer games? Well, here they are. After two years of waiting, we finally got these last three versions, which would end up being MASSIVE improvements over the first three versions. The fourth entry was available on the Amiga computer, the fifth entry could be played on the Atari ST, and the sixth and last entry was released on the DOS. I got all three of them to work on my Steam Deck. When you compare these last three entries together, they might look exactly the same, but if you look hard enough, you'll see some of the differences. The distinct key features that separate these three versions from each other are the background animation, the music quality, and the sound effects. The Amiga version had about four different background layers that move at different paces from each other whenever Thomas moves around. This was done to give off the illusion of distance. The Atari ST version just has three background layers. Only two of them move around at different paces, while the last background layer is immobile. This only gives off a partial illusion of distance. The DOS version only has one background layer for everything, and it all synchronizes perfectly with Thomas's movements. No illusion of distance whatsoever. The music quality and sound effects are also different throughout these three versions. The Amiga game sound effects and music sound like they could come out of a Super Nintendo console, while the Atari ST game and the DOS game sound effects and music sound like they could come out of the original NES console. Between these three different versions and maybe all six versions of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends all together, I think the definitive version out of them all is, without a doubt, the Amiga version. It's got the newly updated sprite details, the design of the world looks the most convincing, and the music and sound effects are at their best here. But enough about the comparison between these three different updated versions. Let's dive into the gameplay and see how different they are from the first three versions. The plot of the game is exactly the same as before. You still have to complete the same seven jobs within a week and try to get as many points as possible to get the high score. But there are a few new changes this time around, besides the visuals and sound design. First of all, there are a lot more characters that make an appearance this time around, instead of just Duck and Diesel. There's also some brand new bonus minigames that weren't present in the previous three versions. There's a brand new card matching memory game that could be played separately from the official story mode. And there's also a racing minigame, which is a bonus stage within the story mode where you control Thomas and have him race against Bertie, Harold, and James. What I personally find strange about this minigame is that you don't earn any extra points if you win the race, which kind of defeats the purpose of this minigame. Another thing that's strange to me is that James is missing his tender. That can't be safe for his driver and fireman, right? Well, that pretty much covers everything about this newly updated version of the very first Thomas computer game. I don't know if I could say this is the best Thomas game ever made, but it's definitely up there in the top 10 at the very least. The whole concept of completing train-based jobs in a hurry to get more points is the perfect basis for a Thomas game. The sprite details are impressive even by today's standards, the gameplay is a perfect blend between frustrating and fun, which will definitely keep you on the edge of your seat, and above all else, this is one of the very few Thomas games that's actually aged pretty well even after 30 years of existence. The fact that this 30-year-old game looks like it could have been made yesterday is one hell of an accomplishment. Overall, I'd say these updated versions are without a doubt the superior versions of the six versions of this game, especially the Amiga version. The first three versions had potential, but these newer installments brilliantly executed that potential and presented it in the best way possible. For that, 
This will be the very first game to make it into the Golden Thomas Video Game Hall of Fame. What an honor. Alright, up next is Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends 2, also called Thomas's Big Race, released in 1993 by Peak Star Software and Alternative Software. Because of the massive success of the last three installments of the first game, we got a sequel game for them. But this sequel game would not be a fourth, fifth, and sixth installment of the Fun With Words sequel game from before. This would instead be a racing game that would follow in the footsteps of the racing bonus stage from the last three versions of the first game. This brand new sequel game would once again have three separate versions of itself. One for the Amiga, one for the Atari ST, and one for the DOS. I got all three of them to work on my Steam Deck. This time, it's a little harder to tell the difference between these three versions. The only way to know which one is which is by listening to the music and sound quality for each one. The Amiga version, once again, has the best music and sound quality of the three, which makes the Amiga version the definitive version in my opinion. Alright, let's dive into the game itself now. The story here is that Sir Topham Hatt decides to race seven of his engines and Birdie against each other to see who's the fastest. That's about it. You'd think the answer to that question would obviously be Gordon, but nope, that's not the case in this game. His speed just had to be nerfed here to make it a fair competition, just like what happened to Sonic in the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games franchise. All you're really doing is racing against the computer opponent, or player 2 if you have a friend over, and get to the finish line first before they do. Along the way, you have to weave through junctions, avoid broken tracks, avoid dead ends, and avoid crashing into other engines. You also need to fill up on water, or gas if you're birdie, and wait for signals, road crossings, or traffic lights to let you pass. There's even a little bonus stage you could take to give yourself the chance to skip half the track if you want. All you have to do is collect all of the letters to spell out the word bonus, and if you do, you suddenly teleport closer to the finish line. That's about all there is to it. Honestly, a part of me feels like Alternative Software only made this game to try to ride on the success of the Super Mario Kart game for the Super Nintendo, considering the fact that this game came out not too long after that game was released. But either way, I still think this is a very solid train racing game. The sprites once again look nice and detailed, the balance between frustration and fun makes another comeback for this game, and the fact that the team behind this game went out of their way to replace the railroad tracks with roads and road-like obstacles for Birdie the Bus is a nice touch. It's not the greatest racing game ever made, but it's kinda nice to see the Thomas franchise take a break from the story-based games and give competitive players something to actually compete over and rage quit over. This is another game that I think definitely belongs in the Golden Thomas Video Game Hall of Fame. You've done it again, Alternative Software. Interestingly, there was another version of this racing game that was made for the ZX Spectrum. This game in particular was called Thomas the Tank Engine 2, and it was also made by Alternative Software. It's technically supposed to be a sequel to the very first version of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends for the ZX Spectrum in 1990. But the Fun With Words game for the ZX Spectrum was made first, and that game was also considered to be a sequel to the first game. So this new racing game is technically the third installment in the ZX Spectrum Thomas series, despite having the number two in the title. This racing game functions very similar to the Amiga version, but the graphics have taken a significant toll to function on the ZX Spectrum, and the only two playable characters in this version are Thomas and Birdie. In fact, this whole game actually takes place during the Thomas and Birdie episode from Season 1, so that's something I guess. However, for unknown reasons, this game was cancelled and never officially released to the public despite being finished. Maybe it was because Alternative Software realized the ZX Spectrum was pretty outdated around that time and they decided, why bother? This is all just speculation of course, so who knows. But somehow, like most unreleased games, it eventually found its way onto the internet. So now, we can finally witness and experience the game for ourselves if we wanted to. While I do think it's nice that we finally get to see what it would have been like after all these years of speculating, my overall thoughts towards this unreleased game are pretty much the exact same thoughts I have towards the first ZX Spectrum Thomas game. 
The graphics are unappealing, the lack of characters certainly don't make a good first impression, and that's startup music. Jesus Christ. Our next game is none other than Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends Adventure Series, released in 1993 by Software Creations and THQ. This is one of the very first home console Thomas games, and it was released on the Super Nintendo and the Super Famicom. I got a ROM copy of the game to work on my analog pocket so that I could try it out for myself. This game is basically just a compilation of some short Thomas minigames that were extremely basic with not a whole lot of challenge to any of them, mainly because this game was targeted towards younger children and no one else. There were a total of 8 minigames that you could play. There was a sliding puzzle game, a set the points game, a jigsaw puzzle, a race against Birdie, a race against Percy, a track fixing game, a reading challenge game, and a pop quiz game. That pretty much covers everything here. You can literally experience the entire game and all of the stories and challenges in less than an hour with little to no replay value. Now, I understand that this is something that was specifically made for toddlers and no one else beyond that, and I'm sure that it might have been a lot of fun for them to play if they liked trains, but still, this is just extremely disappointing when compared to some of the other Thomas games. The races are extremely short, the minigames are incredibly dull, the cursor moves very slowly, and you can get bored of the whole game very quickly. It honestly feels like Software Creations only made this game to try to phone in on Thomas's popularity and make some fat stacks off of it without putting much effort into it. Now, that's not to say there wasn't any effort put into this game, because there is one redeeming feature here, the soundtrack. The music in this game is wonderful. The game pulls directly from the music in the classic era of Thomas that we all know and love, and it translates that music beautifully into the 16-bit era of Nintendo gaming. Not only does it pay a great homage to the classic era of Thomas, but it also gives off the vibes of Super Mario World. I couldn't ask for a better combination if I tried. However, this one saving grace doesn't save the game from its painfully inferiority to the other Thomas games, and that really stings, because this is a Nintendo game. You know, Nintendo, one of the best gaming giants that's partially responsible for saving the video game industry. Now, I know the disappointing quality of this game is not really Nintendo's fault, since they probably didn't have much involvement here, but still. Considering the fact that this was a THQ video game on a Nintendo console, you'd think this would be one of the greats and that it would find a spot into the Golden Thomas Video Game Hall of Fame, but nope, unfortunately that's not the case here. Overall, I'd say this is just an okay Thomas game, but only barely. At least the soundtrack is still pretty good, I'll give it points for that. Interestingly, there was supposed to be another version of this game that would be released on the original NES system. It was almost identical to the Super Nintendo Thomas game, but this one had 8-bit graphics and a completely different soundtrack. Even though the game was finished, THQ decided not to release it commercially. That's probably because THQ must have realized that the NES was 10 years old around that time. And most other third-party gaming companies have pretty much moved on and stopped producing games for it since it was losing its popularity around 1993, so they must have figured, why even bother? However, a ROM copy of this unreleased NES Thomas game eventually found its way onto the internet, so now we can see what it would have been like. I also got this game to operate on my analog pocket as well. It's pretty obvious that this NES Thomas game is exactly the same as the Super Nintendo Thomas game, just with different visuals and more retro-sounding Thomas music. While I do think that it's nice to know that Thomas almost had a moment to shine on the NES, and it's great that we can finally play this game for ourselves online and possibly dump a ROM copy of it onto a blank NES cartridge and put it into an actual NES just for the novelty of having Thomas on the NES and playing the game the way it should have been played, this still isn't something to brag about. 
At the end of the day, this is just another one of those watered-down boring kids games with a lot of missed potential. The music in this game is also pretty cool, I have to admit, but other than that, there's not much else to say. Next, we have Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends Adventure Series, released in 1993 by Malibu Interactive and THQ. While this game does have the exact same title as the Super Nintendo Thomas game, this Adventure Series game, however, is completely different in almost every way, shape, and form. For starters, THQ had this game developed by Malibu Interactive instead of Software Creations. And this game was released on the Sega Genesis. That's right, Sonic's territory. I also got this game to operate on my analog pocket as well. This game was only ever released in America. The land of the free and the home of the brave, am I right? I part the Star Space Banner! In this game, you can choose one of five engines to play with. Either Thomas, Percy, James, Toby, or Duck. You can also give the driver a name of your choosing, change the color of the driver's outfit with the coloring page, and choose which level of difficulty you'd like. Once you've done all that, you have three minigames to choose from. In the first minigame, simply called Game, you're supposed to find specific rolling stock, arrange them in a particular order, and drop each one off at a specific station. The faster you get the job done, the more points you get. The second minigame is called Race. All you have to do is just race against the other engine to get to the finish line first. Along the way, there's some green power-up balloons and sweets you can pick up to make yourself go faster, and some obstacles you have to avoid, like branches and red power-down balloons to keep yourself from slowing down. The final minigame is called Explore. Here, you can completely free roam around the whole island, pick up whatever cargo you'd like, take it wherever you'd like, arrange your train however you'd like, and just drive around and do whatever you want. Now, this is what I consider to be a proper Thomas video game. The gameplay is surprisingly engaging, the sprites look pretty decent, the hard difficulty can actually be a bit challenging as it should be, and the opportunity to just freely explore around the four areas of the Sodor map is an excellent feature that is always welcome in my book. This is basically Train Simulator before Train Simulator. However, as great as this game is, I do have a few minor complaints about this game. The engine's faces look a bit off when they're shown up close, and the in-game music doesn't loop itself. Each time you start a minigame, the music stops playing after one minute of gameplay, and it kind of kills the vibe, honestly. The Super Nintendo Thomas game managed to handle its music correctly, so why couldn't this game do the same thing? I don't know. Nitpicks aside, the Sega Genesis Thomas game is phenomenal, and it definitely set the standard for what the future Thomas game should try to live up to. I couldn't ask for a better concept for a Thomas game, even if I tried. A true MVP in the Golden Thomas Video Game Hall of Fame, if I ever saw one. Genesis what Nintendo don't buy a 16 bit Genesis system between. Next up, we have Waku Waku Thomas, released in 1993 by Sega and Ben Presto. This is another Japanese arcade game, much like the TV phone Thomas game. But this arcade cabinet in particular looks completely different and much bigger. The thing that makes this Thomas arcade game stand out is that it's a part of the Japanese Waku Waku arcade series. For those of you who don't know, Band Presto partnered up with Sega in 1990, and together they created the Waku Waku Arcade Series, which is a series of children's arcade rides. The unique feature of these arcade rides is that you actually had to climb inside these cabinets and sit in the seats to play their respective games. This little mini-series of arcade cabinets would prove to be pretty successful, and by the end of 1993, Sega and Band Presto would release its next entry for the Waku Waku Arcade series. This one, in particular, was themed around Thomas. The arcade cabinet was designed to look exactly like him, but with a large opening on his left side to make it easier for kids to climb into his cab. The arcade screen and controls were mounted where the engine's controls would have been, with the seat being placed along the back of his cab where the opening for his bunker would have been. 
To start it up, you put some money into the coin slot, and the arcade cabinet will dispense a Thomas-themed card. The game will then start up right after that. Strangely, it doesn't seem like you have to put the card inside another slot this time, like you had to with the TV phone arcade cabinet. So I'm not sure what the whole point is for the cards in this arcade cabinet, but okay, another free souvenir I suppose. But the one thing I notice about these cards is that they also feature the CGI Thomas characters. Which could only mean that this arcade cabinet, much like the TV phone arcade cabinet, also got to stick around long enough to witness the CGI era of the show. I honestly don't even know how both of these arcade cabinets managed to get themselves a lifespan of over 20 years of service. Especially when you consider that most of these kiddie rides usually only get about 5 to 10 years of service before they're taken down and replaced with something new. But I guess it's best not to question it. Alright, let's dive into the game itself and see what it's all about. The gameplay is pretty simple. Thomas is just puffing along on his branch line, and you get to decide which direction he'll go. Each possible path you can take will lead you to some different locations and have you interact with some other characters. Two of these locations have their own mini-games with them. One location will have you take Percy's cargo after he's had an accident caused by a landslide, and you need to avoid getting hit by fallen rocks as you take the cargo to its destination. And the other location will have you meet up with Gordon, and you'll race against him to see who can get to the station platform first. That's pretty much all this game has to offer. So what are my overall thoughts? Well, I definitely love the design of this arcade cabinet. All of the cute little details they put into this arcade model of Thomas make it look so nice to look at. As for the game itself, well, it's not great. Now, I understand that this is supposed to be a basic kids arcade game, and it would be completely unfair of me to expect something super groundbreaking here, but I think they could have done a lot better than this. There's only two interactive minigames here. Everything else is just a sightseeing tour of Thomas's branch line. It doesn't offer anything else beyond that, which is a bit upsetting. Even the TV phone Thomas game had a lot more interactive minigames than this. What this thing really needed was an interactive engine cab minigame where you could interact with Thomas's throttle, brakes, whistle, firebox, and everything else needed to drive Thomas around. That would have been the perfect concept for a Thomas arcade cabinet like this. Overall, even though I don't think Waku Waku Thomas is the best Thomas-themed arcade game, it's still a very interesting game nonetheless, and I'm very delighted to see that it also lived a long life. It also might still be around, but I have no information on whether or not it actually is, so I guess we can only hope. 